We are in the middle of a series that I've titled, It's Not About the Destination, It's About the Journey. Now, the destination is the promise. It's us being in the presence of God 24 hours a day, seven days a week, where there is no time, there is no sickness, there is no infirmity. That's the goal of every believer. We want to see Jesus face to face. We even sing songs about it. But today is, is part two. And what I like about that, that title of this series, that it's not about the destination, it's about the journey. It's about knowing, getting to know your Lord and Savior on this side of eternity. It's about getting to know God. I'm not talking about the man upstairs. I'm not talking about the man in the sky, as people refer to him, as the big guy. I want you to know him. Amen. I want you to know him and call him by his names. El Shaddai, Adonai, Elohim, El Elyon, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Shah. I'm talking about getting to know him on a name basis. You know, if I walk up to you and I say, hello, how are you doing, Mr. So-and-so, right? Like I greeted Brother Ryan earlier and I said, Mr. Stone. I just said it because I like his last name, right? <laughs> but in reality, I know that, that we know each other enough to know that I can call him Ryan. You see what I'm saying? And, and to know God in that sense. Not to know God as the person I go visit on Sunday mornings. And today, the title of today's message, this is the second part, part two of this series. The title of today's message is Wake Up. Wake Up. And I pray that by the end of this message, some of us wake up spiritually. Maybe some of you have spiritually fallen asleep. Well, I pray that a revival would take place in your spirit and in your mind and in your soul today in the name of Jesus. Amen. If you have your Bibles, if you would open them up with me, I'm going to read this text. We're going to pray, and then I'm going to have you take a seat. It's John chapter 20, verse 27. John chapter 20, verse 27. And I'm reading this out of the New King James Version this morning. I'll be reading through verse 29 for those of you who are taking notes. John chapter 20, verse 27 through 29. And it says this. Then he said to Thomas, reach your finger here and look at my hands and reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believe. And Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God, Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. But blessed are those who have not seen and yet they still believe. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you right now. And I thank you for this opportunity. I thank you for this privilege. I don't take it lightly, and I don't take it for granted. I pray in the name of Jesus. Your spirit is already here. Spirit of the living God, I pray that you would take over this service right now in the name of Jesus. All I want to do is be your voice, peace, your instrument, your tool against the enemy. Father God, hurl me into the hearts of men and women into this place. Hurl your word into the hearts of of men and women in this place that it would leave an everlasting impact that by the end of this service people would wake up and decide to, to live for you and to go after you with everything inside their being and to go and find out what you created them to do Father God before they take another step. I pray in the name of Jesus that you would bring the fire of revival into this church this morning and that people would be lit up on fire for you by the power and the presence of your Holy Spirit. All I want to do is be your voice piece and your instrument, and the rest belongs to you. You receive all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise, and I thank you in advance for the miracles that are about to take place in this place. In Jesus' name, amen amen. 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 Thank you. Please be seated in the presence of the God of the Lord. You know, when I look at texts in scriptures like this, it reminds me of people in, in the Bible like the Apostle Paul. You see, many of us, we know who the Apostle Paul is because we hear preachers talk about how he wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. But out of all the apostles, Paul was the only one who really didn't spend any time physically with Jesus. But yet he was the one that contributed more to the New Testament than anyone else. And I find it very interesting that the very men who hung out with Jesus, who ate next to Jesus, who slept next to Jesus, who were around Jesus the time and witnessed all the miracles, signs, and wonders that he did, they, they did less for the kingdom of God than one who actually physically didn't even get to see him. They did less, if I could say it like this, they did less on the side of the cross where they had Jesus with them every day 
than the one who met him on that side of the cross, on that side of eternity. You see, and the reason why I say that is because I have a very, very dear friend of mine who claims to be an agnostic and he claims to be an atheist. And he'll say things like, if Jesus were to show up today, then I would believe. Well, I want you to know that Jesus showed up back then and still people doubted and they still didn't believe. Even the people who walked next to him. As a matter of fact, if you read scripture, you'll find out that when they crucified the Messiah, all of them went back to their old ways. All of them went back to their old life because they thought that their dreams and their hopes were dead. And I'm telling you, church, that it's time that we rise up and we be that person of faith. That we be the one that Jesus said, blessed are they that have not seen, but yet they still believe. You see, he was talking about people like the Apostle Paul and he was talking about you and I and this morning we need to make a stand and say I believe no matter what the world says I believe no matter what anybody else says I believe, I believe and I believe I lost my place <laughs> these disciples saw Jesus do miracles, signs and wonders they saw Jesus Raise Lazarus from the dead. They saw Jesus turn water into wine. They saw Jesus heal ten lepers. And they saw them all walk away except for one. And one came back and said, thank you. They saw him set people free from unclean spirits and demonic oppression and possession. They saw Jesus touch blind Bartimaeus' eyes. And they saw blind Bartimaeus regain his sight. And yet they still did less for God and for the kingdom of God than the Apostle Paul. You see, texts and scriptures like this, they really come to life when you think about all that Paul did in his life for the cause of Christ. Next week, we're going to get more into it. This week, we talked about, I mean, last week, we talked about the protection of peace. And this week, I'm talking to you about waking up because next week, we're getting into it not being about the destination, but it being about the journey. But I believe that these are foundational key points that you have to have. And the Bible says, blessed are they who have not seen, but yet they still believe. You know, it's sad because many times people, we don't appreciate what we have while we have it. People have said they don't appreciate it till it's gone. No, I think we need to learn how to appreciate it while we have it. Amen. And God has a tendency to use people who've been rejected and who've been who've been denied in different areas of their life. So if you've ever been rejected, if you've ever been denied, you're in the right place this morning because God loves you and he wants to use you. And then there are people who are so grateful for the very little things that other people take for granted. And we need to be grateful for those things because God loves to reveal himself to grateful people. Grateful people, they'll praise and they'll worship God in the middle of trials. They'll praise and they'll worship God in the middle of Circumstances, they'll praise and they'll worship God in the middle of storms like we talked about last week. There is something about a grateful person. You know, we sang these songs really and truly. The praise and worship team, Rodney and Adrian and Sister Kayla, they were, they were preaching a sermon up here. They truly, truly were. If you listen to the words that are coming out, not just the songs, but if you, if you listen to what was taking place, there is a transfer that is taking place. You're, you're putting yourself aside. That's what I love about worship. It's being thankful. If you notice, out of all those songs that we sang, I can only imagine, and, and uh, what was the other one? Here I am. Here I am to worship. Notice that it doesn't say, I can only imagine if I feel like it. Here I am to worship if I feel like it. It doesn't say that. You see, many of us, if we don't feel like coming to church, we don't have to because we live, we live in a free country. There are countries in this world where we're, where, we're, where we're doing what we're doing right now. They'll kill you. They are called underground churches. And they're doing it in secret. Can you imagine how the power and the presence of God was falling in those places? Can you imagine the presence of the Holy Spirit to know you're sitting here and you're worshiping the Lord. And in any moment, people could come in and shoot you for doing what you've done. And yet you and I, we live in a, in a, in a country where we, if we don't feel like going to church, we don't have to. If I don't feel like worshiping God, I don't have to. If I don't feel like raising my hands, then I don't have, have to. And grateful people, man, they'll worship God in the middle of their trials, in the middle of their circumstances. Amen. Grateful people, though. Amen. Grateful people will speak and preach and teach and share God with everyone, even when they're facing opposition. And that's what 
I'm getting at this morning. I've had many people tell me, oh, I feel like quitting and I feel like giving up because God ain't helping me. God has given you a breath in your lungs and sometimes yeah. when God has given you a heartbeat and he's given you this life and if you're still here, that means he ain't done with you yet. Yeah. And if I need to say it proper, he isn't done with you yet. Yeah. Amen. He's still, you're still a work in progress and he's still working on you and the Bible says, this is what the psalmist said, he said, it is good for me that I have been afflicted so that I may learn your statutes. The reason why they say that it is good that I have been afflicted is because they begin to realize that if they had not been afflicted, that they would never know God at the level that they know God right now. You see, sometimes you don't know God until you're on the other side of that journey. Sometimes you don't know God until you're on the other side of that storm. Sometimes you really don't know what God can do until he shows up and rebukes cancer and rebukes divorce and rebukes disease. Sometimes you don't know God until you're on the other side. And I don't know who this is for, but I know that this is for someone in this place. And nobody appreciates things like somebody who knows what it feels like not to have. Mm, yes, Lord. There are people who yearn and they cry for a better marriage. There are people who yearn and they cry for a better relationship. There are people who yearn and they cry. And there are others who abandon their matrimonies. And there are others who abuse their matrimonies. And there are others who take those things for granted. And Paul, God was preparing Paul with everything that he ever went through in his life to prepare him for how he was about to use him. You know, Paul started out as a persecutor yeah. of Christians. He was totally committed to, to stopping this Christian movement. And it wasn't because he was evil. It wasn't because he was wicked, like many preachers will tell you. It was because he was committed to what he believed. And he saw Christianity as heretical. Am I saying that right? Heretical? 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 You all understand what I'm saying? He saw it as a false doctrine. And it threatened his beliefs. And it threatened his principles. And with great zeal, he went after the followers of the way, as they were called back then. He went after the Christians. And he persecuted them. And he ordered that they be killed. And he was very successful at it. He was very successful at it until one day he met a great blinding light on the road to Damascus. And during that time when he met that great and blinding light, he got scared is what scripture says. And he was blind. He couldn't see. And out of that light, a voice came. And the Bible says that the voice said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And his response was, Lord, I do not know you. This was a follower of God Almighty. He knew scripture. He knew the Torah. He knew the Pentateuch. And yet in this moment, he said, Lord, I don't know you. You see, even a man who knew God, he realized in that moment, I don't know what this is. I don't know what it, what's happening. An educated, scholarly man who was respected by his peers was telling the Lord, I don't know you. And this is where Paul had an awakening. He had... He woke up and he changed his life dramatically and he changed his life profoundly and he changed his life powerfully. He changed his life so suddenly and so profoundly and so dramatically that even other believers didn't believe him. I don't know if y'all know that, but if you read your Bibles, you'll see them they're like, hey, you go with him because he used to, they were like, he used to be against us. Somebody else go with him. like, Johnny, you go with him, right? You ride with him. Y'all go to that Bible study together. We'll, we'll walk, we'll take the bus or whatever. They didn't trust him because he was a persecutor of Christians. Even after he had converted and he had become a follower of Jesus Christ, other Christians were still afraid of him. As a matter of fact, when he's blinded, he's blinded for three days and they take him to a man's house and they tell the man, listen, you're going to pray. God tells the man, you're going to pray over this man and, he, and I'm going to heal him. And he's like, I'm not going to pray over him. He's a persecutor of us. He's like, if he can regain his sight, he's going to know where we're at. No way. <laughs> Ananias was his name, if I remember correctly. And God, the Jesus tells him, now nah, I have a plan. I have a different plan for him. And he's going to suffer many things. You need to pray for him. You see, you don't know what God has you doing. Some of you could be raising the next Billy Graham or the next T.D. Jakes or the next Joyce Meyer. You don't know what God has in store for you until you get to the other side of this thing. And so you need to hold on and you need to hang on. 
So let me paint the picture for you. The, the, the believers, the fellow believers, they didn't trust him. His own people, they didn't want him because they felt like he was a traitor. They felt like he had betrayed what they believed. And here is where Paul got his ministry, got his start in ministry. I want you to think about that the next time you feel like your life is tough. Here's a man who his own people didn't accept him. And people that he once persecuted didn't want anything to do with him. And in the book of Acts, according to scripture, he went into the, the city of, of Ephesus. And at that time, Ephesus was a thriving city. At that time, the people in Ephesus, they worshipped a Roman goddess named Diana. They actually had statues and images and, and temples built to this Roman goddess. She was also depicted in Greek mythology as well. And at this time, Ephesus was full of pagans and it was full of idolaters. For those of you who don't know, idolaters are people who worship idols. So think about what I'm saying. Paul starts off. The people that he once persecuted, they want nothing to do with him. His own people, they don't trust him, and they want nothing to do with him. They consider him a traitor. And then he goes into this city where people are worshiping pagan idols. He either had to be crazy or he had to be courageous to go into a city where, every, where all the odds were stacked up against him. He had to be so convinced that what he experienced on that lonely road to Damascus was so real and so evident that he was willing to lay down his life to preach and speak and teach the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, when you come to know Jesus, it is life changing. It's not just coming to church. It's getting to know him and saying, I will live and die for the cause of Christ. And he didn't have anybody supporting him. Not, not one person. But he was sure about what he believed. Paul went into Ephesus and he was preaching the repentance of sin. He was telling them, you need to get your life right because this right here will send you straight to hell. And he was developing disciples and he was ministering to them day and night. And Paul began to tear down all their strongholds one by one. One idol at a time. One temple at a time. And people were stopping from going in to worship at the temples of Diana. Things were changing. Their behavior and their attitudes were changing. And the pagan priests were mad. And they intended to shut Paul down. They intended to shut down his ministry. You see, when you belong to Jesus, you don't have to worry about all the odds being stacked up against you. Because you have a Redeemer who lives. And the Bible says that he goes before you and he prepares the way. The Bible says that one will put a, two, a thousand to flight. Two, but two will put ten thousand to flight. And it's referring to demons. When you belong to God, you can bind and rebuke in the Bible. Bible says that whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. You see, you don't have to worry about what people are talking, speaking evil about you, because the Bible says, if God be for you, who can be against you? If God be for you, he's, better, he's greater and he's more than the world against you. If God be for you, he's more than the haters and the naysayers that come against you. If God be for you, he's more than any enemy that could ever come against you. All you have to do is do what God called you to do. All you have to do is do what God created you to do, no matter what happens in your life. But today, you've got to set it up in your mind and say, it doesn't matter what happens in my life. I will follow you. It doesn't matter what happens in my life. I will, I will seek you. It doesn't matter what happens in my life. I'm not turning back. I'm not quitting. And I'm not walking away. I belong to you. God will be the one to open up the doors and make a way for you and not anybody else, not yourself. I have so many people coming up to me talking about my ministry. Let me tell you that God will be the one who prepares the way. All you have to do is work on your relationship with God and he will take care of the rest. It's not about, oh, I'm here to be the leader. You're not here to be the leader. You're here to be the servant. If you don't believe me, read your Bible. And I don't care who wrote a book on what I'm telling you, you're here to serve others. And you're not here to serve them so that they can serve you. You're here to serve them because you're a child of God and they're a child of God and you belong to Jesus. And so are they. But you can't stop and you can't quit no matter how hard it gets. I don't care if all hell comes against you. You cannot stop. I don't care if people talk what they say about you behind your back. You cannot quit. I don't care if people like you or not. You can't give in. You belong to Jesus, and God has given you an assignment, and you belong to him. I don't care if people rise up against you. You do not stop. 
You see, many times when the times get tough and storms come into our lives, all of a sudden, when we don't feel it anymore, we want to quit. And if God has ever begun a good work in you, you cannot throw in the towel. Not now. See, many times we stop right before we get our breakthrough. We stop right before we get the promise. We stop right before we get what God showed us in our dreams and in our visions and our prayer time. If God ever saved you, don't you quit. If God ever called you, don't you give up. If God ever commissioned you, you keep on going. Now, you might have to you might have to cry at times and wipe your tears from your eyes. But after you're done crying, you get back up and you get back in this thing because you belong to Jesus. It ain't over yet. There will be times where you might have to cry yourself to sleep. But after you're done crying in the morning, get up and get back in this fight. There is a scripture in the Bible that says that sorrow may last for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Did you believe the Lord Jesus? He is blessed. And before you can understand who you are in the Lord, you need to understand who he is. And you need to understand what he is able to do in your life. You see, you can't be blessed if you don't realize that you, you serve a blessed God. And you might not know what God is going to do in your life. You might be here this morning saying, I don't know if God's going to do something in my life or not. Well, I want you to know that whether he does it or not, he is able to do it. You might not know if he's going to heal you or not. Well, I want you to know that he can heal you. In just a moment, all he has to do is say, peace, be still, like we talked about last week. You need to know that God knows what's best for you. And sometimes you're going through the stuff that you're going through because there's either something that he's rooting out of you or it's because it's where he's taking you. If you don't believe me, just read the book of Acts and you will see detours in Paul's life and in his ministry. But yet those detours, they guide him along the way from miracle to miracle, or as the Bible says, from glory to glory and from faith to faith. You see, God already knows the answer to every prayer that you'll ever pray. He is the blesser. He is the gift giver. He is the miracle maker. That's who he is. And so the Bible says that God made man, and when he made man, he made him in his image and in his likeness. When God made you, he made you in his image and in his likeness. And if that's the case, if he is blessed, then you must be blessed too because you look like daddy. You all understand where I'm coming from? If he is blessed, then you must be blessed too. That's why you and I, we can't settle for mediocrity. We can't just say, eh, that's just the way things are. You've got to do what God created you to do. You've got to do what God called you to do. And God is going to finish what he started in you. Each and every one of us. There's a scripture in the Bible that says, He who has begun a good work in you shall see it to completion until the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, He wouldn't have given you life if He wasn't. Do you hear what I'm telling you this morning, church? He wouldn't have given you life if He wasn't God enough to see it all the way through. And some of you have taken a sabbatical in your walk with God. Oh my God, I feel like something is going to happen in this service. I feel. The power of God in this place. I feel victory and liberation and freedom in this place. I feel deliverance and healing in this place. I feel God's glory and his anointing in this place. Sickness, infirmity, and disease, you better be gone in the name of Jesus because these people belong to Jesus. Addiction and oppression, be gone right now in Jesus' name because we serve a blessed God this morning. start believing, even though you haven't seen it, that you are blessed because you serve a God that is blessed. I'm telling you that you're blessed this morning. You might not be able to feel it right now. You might not be able to see it right now, but I'm telling you, church, you're blessed. Oh, yes, you are. Yes. And it's not about your job. It's not about your car. It's not about your house. It's not about your finances. It's not about who you're married to. It's not about who your children are. It's about who your God is. Amen. And God loves to bless his people. Oh, yes. And you've been called to be a reflection of God. Did you know that? The Apostle Paul talks about it, how we're a mirror to think of God's image. You are made in the image and in the likeness of God is what the book of Genesis says. You are to reflect God to people. Amen. That means that you shouldn't reflect failure and you shouldn't reflect worry and you shouldn't reflect anxiety or doubt or shame or fear or defeat. 
you because you serve a victorious God. You serve a God that cannot fail. You serve a God that does not worry. You serve a God that knows no fear. You serve the undefeated God. That's what you say. And the closer that you get to him, the more blessed that you will be. Devils and demons, you better run or you got the chance to people are about to wake up in this place this morning. I'm confessing it now in the name of Jesus. The Holy Spirit is about to rain down blessings in this place. And I'm going to tell you, I'm not a prosperity preacher. That's not what it's about. But just like you got to hear all the other stuff, you got to hear who you are as a child of God. And people don't mess with a child of God. So fear, shame, and doubt, you better run in the name of Jesus. You see, some of you have been blessed with power. Some of you have been blessed with discernment. Some of you have been blessed with a gift of influence. Some of you have been blessed with an anointing that nobody else has. Witches and warlocks, they can't curse you because you're blessed. Yes. Devils and yes. demons, they yes. have to leave you alone because you're a child of God and because you're God's anointed. You see, some of you have been blessed with ideas and creativity that nobody else has. And the kingdom of God needs your ideas and they need your creativity. Some of you have been blessed with healing. Whether it's to pray over people and God heal them or whether it's because you're being healed constantly and you know how to be healed in the name of Jesus. Amen. You see, some of you have blessings that you haven't even touched or tapped into yet. Lord have mercy. Because you've stayed idle or stifled in your walk with the Lord. And let me tell you, if you hang out with another believer, you should always be blessed. Amen. You hang out with me, you're going to be blessed. Amen. You're leaving blessed. Amen. Amen. When people hang out with you, they should be blessed too. You should be a blessing everywhere you go. Even if people are pronouncing curses over you, you should be a blessing as well. Yes. You've been blessed with more than enough, according to what we're reading. Some of you are about to walk out of here so blessed that people are going to say, here comes, here comes the blessed one. Amen. Or like Johnny said on Wednesday, here comes God's favorite. You know, at my work, I have a standing joke with my, some of my coworkers. And some of them watch, watch this and they'll... They'll attest to it, God willing, one day when they come. But if something happens, let's say, I don't know, let's say I say something like, uh, hey, we're going to do this today or whatever, right? Or I'll say, ooh, man, I hope this happens. Or, ooh, I pray this happens. And then it happens. My coworkers will be like, man, you called it. And I'll say, God's favor. Right? I'm not saying I'm God's favorite. I'm just saying I'm probably one of the top five. Nah, I'm just kidding. No. What I'm saying to you is when you're a child of God, there is power in your tongue. The Bible says that you have the power of life and death in your tongue when you're a child of God. You see, because when you speak, God is listening. God is so crazy about you that he's listening. And some of you, you haven't even reached all your blessings yet. You know that the Bible says that the, your best is yet to come? No, your best is yet to come. Why do you think the devil's fighting you so hard? He wouldn't be fighting with you if God was finished with you. You see, there's still some, some, some time to fight. There's still some stuff to do for the kingdom of God. Your best days are still ahead of you, according to Scripture. You see, some of you need to receive that this morning. Some of you need to receive it in your spirit. You have to be blessed in your spirit before you can be blessed. In the physical, you have to be healed in your spirit before you can be healed in your body. You have to be free in your spirit before you can be free in your body. You have to be loose in your spirit before you can be loose in your body. I need somebody to receive that right now. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Because you've been walking around defeated as a Christian. And that's not the way, the, those things are out of order. You're a child of the living God. And the victory is yours according to Scripture. I want to share another text with you. If you have your Bibles, if you would, and I'm about to wrap this up. If you would turn your Bibles with me to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 through 6. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 through 6. And I'm reading out of the New, New King James Version still. I want you to pay attention to what, what this text is saying. I really wanted to read you the whole chapter. But I know some of y'all got a little bit of a man. Okay, no. Uh, I wanted to get to the, to the meat and potatoes of this for you. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 through 6, and the New King James Version says this. 
Blessed be God, and blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who was blessed, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Verse 4. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we might be holy and without blame before him in love. Verse 5. Having predestined us to, to adoption as sons by Christ Jesus to himself, according to the, the good pleasure of his will. To the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us, accepted us into the beloved. In other words, church, if you continue to read on, as a matter of fact, that can be the point where you read on in verse 14 or 15 or 17, whatever it is. You were his before you ever got saved, according to what I'm reading. You were his before you ever stepped foot or before you ever came to church. You were his while you were still at the nightclub. If I could say it like that, can I say it like that? You were his while you were still at the strip club. You were his while you were sick, while your mind was still in the gutter. You were his according to scripture before he formed you and he fashioned you and he placed you in your mother's womb. You were his according to what we just read before the foundation of the world and he chose you. So for those of you who think you haven't been chosen, I'm here to tell you if you have a breath in your lungs and you have our feet, he chose you and he picked you. Oh my God. That's why you're here, because he chose you, and you belong to Jesus. You see, he didn't pick you because of anything that you could do. He didn't pick you because of anything that you've ever done. He picked you according to what we read, because he felt like it, according to his, the will of his good pleasure. All that means, that's just Bible for saying, because I felt like it. You see, because he loves you that much. And some of you, you've been living and you've been raised a Christian way, and I'm not knocking it. Because I was raised that way too. But then when you fall and when you fail, you backslide because you feel like I'm not worthy. None of us are worthy. Let me just clarify that. But then you feel like you feel like you, you feel like I failed, so now I've got to get up and I've got to take my shame and I've got to take everything else with me and walk out the door because I'm a failure. And the truth of it is, is this, is that in the book of Proverbs, it says that the righteous man, though he falls seven times, he gets back up again. You and I need to be that righteous man and woman. And every time that we fall, we need to get back up and start walking with Jesus again. You see, when you walk with the Lord and when you belong to the Lord, you, when you belong to him, there is no letting go. There is no quitting. There is no giving up. You belong to Jesus. He picked you because he felt like it. Oh, yes. According, the, according to his good will is what it says. Like he just felt like it. As a matter of fact, God picked you before you were ever born. The scripture says he chose you in him before the foundation of the world. In other words, there was nothing. And it was nothing. And it wasn't anything that you could have ever done to make God choose you. Amen. If I may have the freedom to say it like this, as crazy <laughs> as some of you are. With all your faults, with all your flaws, with all your failures, with all your victories, you still belong to God. Amen, amen. And the scripture says, by his grace, he made us accepted into the beloved. But this morning, you got to wake up and you got to start believing that you're a child of God. Can I get the praise and worship team up here? you got to start believing Oh man, we got plenty of time. We got plenty of time for a miracle to happen and take place. You gotta start believing whose baby you are. You gotta start believing who your God is. See, some of you are sitting there, you're telling God how big your problems are. And I'm not trying to sound cliche, but you need to start telling your problems how big your God is. You need to start rebuking that devil out of your life. You need to stop saying, I deserve this. Because according to scripture, when you're a child of God, you're worthy of his son, Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus gave his life up for you so that you could live for him. And some of you may be sitting here saying, well, I didn't ask him to do it. That's right. Real men, you don't have to ask them. They step up to the plate every single time. Because it's the right thing to do. And because no one else could do it. My friend who's an agnostic and who's an atheist, I love him to death. I truly do. And it hurts my heart when he says things like, if Jesus were to come right now, then I would believe. 
Then he'll say, there's no documentation that Jesus really existed. You don't have to just look in the Bible. You can look it up in history. Jesus really existed. And I don't, I'm not here to convince you because that's already been proven to over 2,000 years ago. But what I am here to do is to tell you that you and I, what the Apostle Paul did and the example that he said, it takes away our excuse to say to one another, imagine what it would have been like to be there with Jesus. Because the Apostle Paul wasn't there with Jesus like the other disciples were. But yet he did more than any of the other disciples did for the kingdom of God. And I believe that that's the first fruit of the text that we opened up with. Blessed are they who have not seen, but yet they still believe. In other words, what God, what God is, tra is translating to us is that you didn't have to be there. You just got to live by faith. The Bible says that the righteous shall live by faith. That's you and I. If we're, if we're born on this side of the cross, if we're born in this generation, then that's you and I. That's our job. You see, their job was to walk with him and to talk with him and to learn from him so that they could teach us through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and through the rest of the Gospels. It's your and I job. You're your minding your job to walk this thing out. Amen. The Bible says to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. You see, this morning, I want to call believers to the carpet to say, you know what? No more will doubt, fear, and shame live in my life. I have no room for it. I belong to Jesus. Paul said this one time in the book of Ephesians. He said, he, was, he wrote a letter to Ephesus and he said, to the church at Ephesus, and he said, be imitators of me. This morning I stand here as a minister of the gospel and I say, be an imitator of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. This morning, would everyone please stand to your feet? I say this altar call here is for the countries who are, are under the threat of death and persecution for having an altar call like we're about to have. You and I live in a country where we're free to worship the way that we want to worship. And people have paid the price and they've given the ultimate sacrifice. Not only Jesus, but our soldiers, our clergy who have gone abroad to preach the gospel. And this morning, I want to open up the altar because of what they've done. You see, you and I, we live in a country where we can be spoiled if we want to. And we can say, well, I don't know if it's true, but this is what they say at church. Oh, I don't know if it really happened. I don't know if they made it metaphorically or if they made it if they meant it literally. And this morning, I want to call every believer to the carpet and say, if God has ever saved you, if God has ever called you, if God has ever commissioned you, don't you give up on your dreams. Don't you give up on what God has shown you. You're a child of God and you 
presence, in the presence of the Almighty. In the same attitude of worship, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. bound by some type of addiction or bondage. If you want to be set free this morning, you want to be dedicated and recommit your life to God, all I'm going to ask you to do is raise your right hand and put it right back down. Let's see. Wow. Wow. Praise God. Thank you for your boldness. Thank you for your courage. Not only do I see you, but the Almighty sees you. And I want you to know that He's proud of you like a loving Father. I'm going to ask you to take the next step. And let, me, let, me, let me justify it. The Bible says that they that call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It says that every one of us has sinned and we've all fallen short of the glory of God. But it also says that he sent his one and only son to die for you and I. So that we could have everlasting life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever would believe would not perish, but have everlasting life. And then in the book of Romans, he said, and if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and that he died for your sins and that on the third day God raised him from the dead, the Bible promises that you shall be saved. And so within that same attitude of gratitude, that same attitude of worship, I want to lead you in a prayer. You say it however you want, but the keys are the requisites are that you confess it with your mouth. Don't let the devil hold you bound any longer. And that you believe in your heart. This Jesus that I've been speaking about to you for the last hour or so. I want you to know that he's, he's here. This Holy Spirit is here. And he came to redeem you because you belong to him. Would everyone in this house say, Heavenly Father. I don't have one in Spanish. 
Spanish. I'll get you one. Okay, we got one somewhere. He said, I need one in Spanish. I don't know if y'all heard it. So if somebody's got a Spanish Bible, Pastor Robert, we got a Spanish Bible for Brother Willie. We can bless him with it. We're about to be dismissed. We're about to pray to be dismissed. And remember, you belong to Jesus no matter what comes in your way and what comes against you. The enemy's mad because there's been some breakthroughs and there's been some freedom in this house this morning. Hang on to Jesus. Don't let him, don't, don't let the enemy win in your life. You know. Next week, we're going to wrap this thing up. It's not about the destination. It's about the journey. By your friends. If you were blessed by these two last weeks, you're gonna, this, it's going to bring it home for you. Uh, thank you. If you're interested in being in our Christmas presentation, our play, even if it's in the background or whatever, we need a lot of characters. So please stay afterwards for a small, very quick, very brief meeting. I know you're in church and they always tell you that and then 30 minutes later we're still here. That ain't going to happen today. My wife is in charge of this, so she's going to chop chop. Okay, it'll be quick. Uh, please, if you're interested, we need characters, we need role players, and we'd love to have you. It's going to be a lot of fun, and we'll explain the meeting afterwards. Right there where you're at, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you right now, and I thank you for our time together. I pray in the name of Jesus that you would bless us as we walk out of here. I thank you for this word. I thank you for this message. I believe that every one of us receives something from it. I pray, Father God, that as we walk out these doors, that church would begin, and that we would be the church. And that you would use us the way that you see fit. And that you would use us to advance your kingdom and to attack the gates of hell. Let us always remember that we don't belong to this world, but we belong to you. And that if we're your children, that we are blessed like the way you are blessed because you're the blesser. As we leave this place, Father God, let us not leave your presence. Now, may the Lord bless you and may he keep you. May he make his face shine upon you. Yes. May he turn his countenance towards you and give you peace. In Jesus' name. Jesus. Amen. Church, I love you. Have an awesome, awesome week. God bless you.